Today is Friday, December 1st, 2023, and you have found the Living Youth Podcast. I'm here as always with my broadcast co-host, Mr. Wallace G. Smith. Mr. Smith, though we knew it was coming, did December sneak up on you the way it did for It me? did sneak up on me. I mean, just looking at it on my laptop here and seeing it say Fry Des 1 <laughs> is, is throwing me off a little bit. Yeah, it's a little while to get to this, but today... We know that you young people out there are seeing the news. You're seeing various uh, things in your news feeds and maybe on television when your family's watching. We want to help you think biblically about the Israel-Hamas conflict uh, in terms of we know you're hearing things and we you know, we want to make sure our heads are on straight thinking yeah. about some of these things. So that's what we're going to talk about. That today. sounds great. I hope we don't go too fast for everyone today. Here it is at the, close to the end of the day, Friday, and actually the office is going to be going to be closing here yeah. pretty quickly. So we it's have be a ghost we have town. some motivation. This hopefully won't be one of our fourteen hour podcasts. I don't I don't think it will be. Um, but we talked earlier. We do want to talk about uh, the conflict in Gaza between Israel and Hamas, and and we we waited a while to do this. I would say, Mr. Robinson, I can definitely speak for you, but I, I feel and I can speak for myself. But I think our emotions were pretty hot, you know, in terms of. We come back from the feast, mm-hmm. and this terrible attack has happened on October seventh, and and I know we were we were talking about it a lot. Yeah, we 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 both felt like we needed we needed some time for some more facts to come out because you know it's a little fuzzy there at first, and everybody's making claims, and w- you and I both f- feeling like, well, we if we're gonna t- if we're gonna try to talk about this and 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 try to offer some insight, um, we better understand the topic ourselves. But yeah. then even after that we quickly pivoted towards what are we going to put in the magazine and we started putting some articles together and we felt like we needed to get some things put in place before we talked about it. Oh yeah. And we're not going to, we're not going to get into a lot of uh, extremely profound things today. We have a very particular focus today, but also we knew Mr. Weston had things he wanted to say. And, uh, and actually the, the magazine that we, we literally just gave to reviewers mm-hmm. today, like an hour ago, like about an hour ago, we're sending it to the printer. God willing next week on Tuesday, has an article from Mr. Weston, has a uh, uh, an article from Mr. Hernandez, uh, and it's it's really themed. I mean, we've got three items, I think, in this one about the conflict in Gaza and in terms of what God says in prophecy, et cetera. So we're excited about that. And anyway, we, we didn't want to accidentally get ahead of all of that. And I think it's been good. To, it's, it's kind yeah. of allowed things to take some time, but specifically, and I want to, I want to give Mr. Robinson credit for noticing this there. Well, and I'll let him talk about it a little more, but we noticed there's a lot, there's a lot of chatter out there from different sources and, and, and including quote unquote Christian sources, these kind of mainstream or evangelical Christian sources. And we know as teenagers and as young adults, you've got friends in the workplace or friends in school that are also seeing these images on the news and they're making their comments about it. You might have little clubs in school, you know, that are trying to support whatever, or you might have, um, uh, even, uh, quote unquote, again, mainstream Christian friends, and they're trying to talk about what the Bible says about all these things. Well, you're exposed to all of that. And and we want to address just a few of the kind of misconceptions or related questions that you might be hearing out there and help you think biblically about that. Mr. Mr. Robinson, maybe you could expand because I really appreciate that you have noticed so much of this going on. Well, one of the things I observed, you know, if, if you've been in the church for some time or grown up in the church, and you've paid attention to these things at all, you already have like a context for these conflicts that flare mm-hmm. up. You know, uh, God blessing the church with the understanding of the identity of many nations and the identity of Israel really adds a context for us that other people don't have. And it kind of gets in the mood to think about those things, you yeah. know, in a way that other people don't. Yeah, exactly. And so it was fascinating to me. I, I had observed at least one of these before. No, I, I would say two of these points that we're going to talk about I had observed before. But this new conflict really brought them to mind again, and it's co- sort of fascinating. So the first two things I observed that was really interesting to me is the average non-church person out there, and you know we're we're in America, of course, so primarily we're observing what other Americans think. But with the global, you know, social media community out there, a lot of people fall into to these categories. And one of the first questions, or or it's sort of like this idea that. If somebody asks you what your opinion is, whether you've had one previously or not, you feel like you should have an opinion on it. Right. And I think that leads to the first observation I have, which was, oh, 
the the Hamas attacked Israel and, and Israel has, has invaded the Gaza Strip. Whose side should I be on? That's right. that's a big one. It's uh, it it I even I, I don't want to trivialize this, and I don't mean it with this. But it's sort of like if you watch any kind of football or basketball game, most people feel like they need to pick a side to root for if they're going to watch this thing. And it feels like it's such a divisive issue that, that people do feel pressed to support one group or the other. Now, not, not everybody does, but it's like, well, who are the good guys here? I think right. is the subtext to the question. And, and in case anyone is getting worried out there, we are going to be uh, very plain about the horrors of October 7th. We're not going to get too graphic here on the program because we know we have younger listeners. But that said, that's different than this pressure that society puts on you now. Like if you got a social media account, Hey, you better put the flag of the people you support inside your inside next to your name on whether it's Twitter or Instagram or something. Got to make sure you put the emojis that are supportive of this group. It's like the world presses you to have to be on a side and being on a side means making sure you show support, make sure you re- retweet this, or mm-hmm. I say retweet cause I'm a Twitter guy, but you know, uh, share this or do that. And there's this is kind of pressure that you've got to take a side and it's a, it's a very political kind of side. Yes. And yet the spirit of taking sides, you can see all around us how it is corrupting everything. Like the craziest thing. And I commented in it on a, uh, commentary right after I mean, it was right there at the end of the feast. I, I, I wrote, we, I was in the airport actually, because we were trying to write something about this event that had just taken place on the last great day. And it was one of the most ridiculous things I feel like I've seen in my life. It was a, a group code pink. I'll give their name. It's a feminist organization. And they were putting out social media things in support of what had, of the, what the uh, Hamas had just done in, on October 7th which clearly included rapes and brutality of women. And here you have this feminist organization that is just kind of rooting them on. And I don't want to go into the graphic details that were revealed about what took place that day, but it's like, that's absolutely ridiculous. In fact, uh, I wish I could think of the analogy. You see a lot of people come out uh, from the LGBTQ crowd and they have signs LGBTQ for, for Palestine right, or whatever right. it is. And someone was saying, Oh, I wish I could, what's the analogy? I should have prepared better for this. They say, it's almost like, I don't know, cows rooting for McDonald's or yeah. it's just a uh, chickens <laughs> for Chick-fil-A because in that country, they would not be tolerated. Yes. You know, there's just you, your entire lifestyle. And you know, you have some countries where they're, if they're not being executed, they're being thrown off of buildings mm-hmm. for, for yep. being LGBTQ. And the idea that, but what, what had gotten a hold of these people, this, this feminist organization is this idea of, Hey, these people are on our side and they're defining sides in this case, based on frankly, a bunch of social Marxism that here's the, what they figure is the impre- oppressed people, which are the Palestinians versus the oppressors, which they feel are the Israelis. And, but this, I also call it sideism, this idea that you must pick this side and be overt in your, in your comments about it had just taken over that mentality. And, and you see young college age people getting sucked up into that. So you see protest on your campus, you see sign our pledge for this. And we, we need to be thinking differently about these things. There's a profound deficit of understanding amongst the LGBTQ groups that support the, 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 uh, the Hamas and they, they don't, they don't understand. They don't understand. Yeah, I saw an Israeli bit. It was kind of like an Israeli television comedy bit, uh, at least online. And they were mocking American LGBTQ attitudes, uh, I think they, they might have been speaking English. I think they were. It, it, but they essentially had these two people, purple hair, green hair, said they're supposed to be these LGBTQ students at a particular university that had that had done this. And they're like, oh, you know, it's so wonderful what's happening, you know, and, you know, Palestine from the river to the sea. And, oh, we're talking with one of our friends there. And, and so they get a dual screen like on the news and it's a supposed to be a Hamas terrorist. He's mm-hmm. got the, he's got his only, you can only see his eyes mm-hmm. and he's wearing all the equipment and he's mocking them the whole time. And he says, uh, I heard it he goes, Oh, uh, if you were in my country, both of you, I would, I would throw you off the roof and kill you. <laughs> and they say, Oh, you want to throw a roof party for us? Did oh, you hear that? Wow. I mean, there's complete, I mean, of course it's a comedy yeah. bit, but at the same time it, it is ridiculous. And to me, it shows how utterly irrational mm-hmm. this kind of extreme hyper side taking yep. is in the United States and the attitude we have today. And and it was on both sides. Did you did you note? I feel like there must have been some real behind the scenes pressure 
on from from the Israel side, since there's as uh, has been in the news the last few months, there's um there's many there's many of Jewish ancestry in the entertainment industry, and there seemed to be some pressure on them to make sure that they supported the Israel side, or if something came up that they 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 were clear that they they don't you know they're. Uh, Avid, not avidly, they're they're actively fighting against anti-Semitism, and you know, and and I think a couple of people were tossed off of programs who who were had taken a pro-Palestinian side. Right, you know that that is it's, it's so it's so interesting because anti-Semitism has become one of those words that's mm-hmm. of course very heavy, but then it's wielded. It's like anytime something, whether it's the word racism or all these other different words, bigotry, whenever people find it has power to diminish an opponent in a Mm -hmm. discussion, then it's wielded really whether it applies or not. That's why you have, for instance, people who are upset about, uh, say, the the investments or the donations of George Soros in terms of various, and I know some of you listening don't even know who that is, but he is a Jewish individual who has a lot of money, and he pours a lot of money into a lot of particular social causes that I, I just say, I don't agree with a lot of those social causes, but then people will say, oh, for, well, to criticize him, you're being anti-Semitic. Right. Well, don't get me wrong. There probably are some anti-Semitic people that just like, oh yeah, I, he, he's Jewish. I, I don't like that. But there are all people that have just legitimate questions or concerns and they, and they are, they ask that. And there are some, right. It, actually, Hollywood has been fascinating about this because there's the socially liberal side that would really want to put many of them on the side of say, you know, the Palestinian cause in this mm-hmm. case, the Hamas and such. And then you also have so many with, uh, with, with ties to, to Jewish, uh, friends and so many of themselves being Jewish and that, that presses them to want to come out for the other. And it really is interesting seeing the internal division and right. bickering and you have people right. losing their podcast this way or, or the other way. It's kind of like, they don't even know. Uh, it's like, it's a, such a split mentality. They just don't know what to yep. do. And it's kind of tearing, tearing them apart. The other thing I noticed, because once once people who don't really pay attention to maybe say geo, geopolitical events and or have not had their because it's been a while since there's been a major conflict. And mm-hmm. in, in fact, I think that it was what the 50th it was one day off of the 50th anniversary. of. It the, was. You had to think it was timed that way. The 50th anniversary yeah, deliver, of, yeah. of the, the, the last major conflict like that. And so so once people thought you know, kind of went through this, this mental exercise of, well, should I pick a side? Whose side should I be on? Once people kind of analyzed what was going on, then the question shifted to who has a better claim for the land. Right. So and, for, oh, let me wrap up on the yeah. whose side you should be on. Like, just kind of, a, it's a pert answer because I'm i glad you've gone on to number two because I feel like those two are related. But before you leave number one about whose side you should be on, let me give you what is always the answer. Be on God's side yes. on these things. Step back a bit and try to look for biblical principles and what God is doing and don't get caught up in people trying to suck you into what is essentially a political position. Just step back and ask questions. What is God doing? What is God trying to accomplish here? And what does the Bible say? So kind of keep those things in mind as we go forward, because that's going to bring us to yeah, into no, the second point. Mr. Robbins is bringing yeah, That's a good point. The state of Israel right now is largely a secular nation, though, though, there, though there are Orthodox Jews that are there and many of Jewish descent, of course, it's a secular nation. They're, they're not in a holy war that God has, has uh, inspired for them to be in to, to take care of a problem. It's, it's just human, human leaders using human reasoning, um, fighting a war against enemies that have been there for a long time. You know, we certainly would never support, you know, Hamas and that kind of mentality and everything. You know, you do feel sorry for the Palestinian civilians that are in the, caught in the crossfire. But then there's also questions about how many of the civilians um, fully support what Hamas was doing. And so there's just this messy process at work there. And the simplest answer is the only thing that's going to resolve this is in this part gets gets covered in the articles that are going to come out is until Christ returns, which some people view as a cop out, but I'm sorry, it's just the answer until Christ returns and sorts things out and reestablishes things, how we intended them to be right now. It's two secular groups. I mean, I know that there there's religious overtones to it, but from a true biblical perspective, it's, 
it's deceived people fighting against each other. Just simply pray for the peace of Jerusalem, like David says. Uh, sigh and cry for those who suffer. Uh, be upset when you see injustice and allow God the freedom that he deserves as the great sovereign to sort out things for the sake of, for the sake of his plan. Because I agree, it's uncomfortable. Like if someone asked me if America were in a war, like let's say somehow we get involved in Ukraine, let's say things start going really south. Right. Who should and next thing I know, there, yeah. the United States is involved in Ukraine. Well, I, I don't want to, I'm not going to root against my country. And yet at the same time, I'm not going to root for them just because they're my country. The thing is, I'm not going to root at all. I'm going to pray that God will bring it to a close cleanly that, 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 that people will a few, as few of many, uh, as few as possible will get hurt. But at the same time that his will be accomplished because that's the overall important thing. And I'm trying to look for a larger picture. So these are large things to talk about, but it's because uh, no matter how you say it, it it's going to come across kind of controversially. But at the same time, that's what we're trying to emphasize. And when you're young, getting your head straight on about this is all the more important because if anything, the voices that, that all the ideologues in the world want to corrupt as much as possible, it's yours because the people your age they see as the future voters. They see as the people that can shake things up at the university. Right. And so there's a lot of pressure on you, but we have to be able to step back and say, look, I am a Christian. All I care about for the most part, I mean, not for the most part, the thing I care most about is seeking the kingdom of God and that his will be done on earth and that his prophetic plan moves forward the way it is supposed to. And I will pray for the innocent and I, I, I will I'll ask for justice where it belongs and mercy where God is willing. And I know I'm kind of rambling at this point, but it, it's because it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to talk about these things just kind of cleanly and smoothly. Right. Well, you made me think of maybe even a better way to articulate what my view would be, which is step back, big picture, God's will, that more than anything else, he's probably putting things in places so that his end time will will be done. That, so the things that have yes. been prophesied about will come. So I, I guess if we were, how would we view looking at it from, from a godly perspective, it would be looking for signs that this is setting up bigger end time things that we're told to watch for. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's kind of like a, if Germany gets more involved more deeply in Ukraine, well, are you going to root for Germany or Ukraine? Was like, I, what I'm going to do is wonder, okay, how is this going to move things closer to Germany's position in the end times? You know, that's, that's exactly what I'm going to look for. And yeah, I, I think so. It's uh, I think that's, I think that is a helpful way to help way to put it. Well, we don't have to spend a lot of time on the second point, but one of the things I observed and interestingly though, though there are many um, evangelical Christians conservative Christians who are very supportive of Israel, there's a small subset in addition to people who would, who would be naturally more um, take the Palestinian perspective or the Hamas perspective who actually don't view Israel positively. And I've heard them explain, well, look, uh, you know, where, where did these Israel Israelites came from? You know, the Palestinians were there up until 1948 when the Israelis came in and started, you know, and all the history behind that. And, and it's funny because they want to just stop there. Well, you know, the Palestinians, as we right. think of them, were there before 1948, so naturally they should have it. But right. what happened before 1948, you know, but at the time before the, the Palestinians got there, who was there, you know? Right. I think it was the the Ottoman Empire ruled over that area for a couple hundred years leading up to World War II. So, you know, the idea of who should own the land is, it, in, in some ways it's actually a very simple answer when you when you know what we understand in the church, but for everybody else, it's very complicated and a fight over who was there first. Right. Exactly. And it's, you know, it is interesting. Uh, we see that in actually, I'd say in many Western countries all over the world, because there's a question like, well, you're a colonizing people. So should you even be here? You know, you should leave because there were people here before you that, that maybe were displaced by your presence. And yet on the other hand, like North America is a really good example. It's not like North America was simply this amazing paradise of peaceful peoples just living together in absolute harmony, and then suddenly Europeans showed up. Absolutely not. There was also warfare going on. There were people taking lands from other people. Absolutely. Uh, when when Columbus showed up, you know, part of the the uh, the locals there, the 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 native population welcomed him because he put down some of the other more violent 
tribes, you know, in some of his later trips, the history of Columbus in the area, he has painted as such a villain when he came, but frankly, he, he was a, now, and he also did work with some people who were villains and he got them in trouble. But that said, it's, it's, it's all so complicated when it comes to the Holy land in particular, because, you know, you look at the Israelites, well, it's, we often just say Jews, but as we know in the church, the Jews are only you know, two tribes. And of course you have the Levites and such out of the total of 12 tribes, but you have Israelites in the land and then they get punished and God, you know, has them uh, deported and removed from the land, uh, Israelites, and then the Jews, and then you have them brought back into the land. And then you have the, uh, the Romans come and the Romans kick them all out, you know, and, and destroy Jerusalem. And then now you have them back in 1948. So in terms of people say like, well, who has the right to the land as if there's a deed somewhere you know, and it's just been signed by an official and they, they have a mortgage on the land. The closest thing to who has any kind of claim to the land would have to be what, what God says. And the fact is God did give that land to Jacob as an inheritance. And that would mean that it is, it is the Israelites who do belong there. But that said, God, for his own purposes, has had the land vomit the people out for various sins and he does punish the people. And so again, we don't really get caught up in that. We just look at the broader picture, which is one, God promised that land to Abraham and then to Isaac and then to Jacob. And we know in the end times, it's going to have to be Jews in the region. Why? Because we know that sacrifices have to begin before everything falls apart. They had the sacrifices have to begin and then they have to be cut short. They have to end. So we know that there has to be an end time presence of the Jews in the land. And again, that's what we, that's what we focus on is what God is working out in the area. As for the Palestinians, uh, I, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to jump into it too much because we do talk about it in an article that's coming out. Uh, Mr. Hernandez has done some wonderful work in that regard and, and has written about like, well, how did they get to be in the land in the first place, the Palestinians and where, where do they come from? You know, what are the origins of that people there? And, uh, without, without, well, actually is that, Oh, you know, this kind of could blend into number one, number three, a little bit. Okay. Would that be a good time? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be good. Uh, As, I might make no go, go one point as we move on because, um, you know, uh, it was a little over a year ago now that I listened to a, a lengthy podcast series that was talking about the Spanish conquest of what we would think of as modern Mexico, which oh, was, okay. was the Aztec Empire. And one of the things that really struck me, um, you know, Cortez was the main Spanish leader who, who led this. And they were really significantly fewer in numbers compared to the, the natives that were living in the land, the Mesoamericans. So there you have this vast Aztec empire. And so really comparatively a handful of Spanish conquistadors are there. Now they do have better technology and they're better armed. And they had some things that, that like, for instance, they had horses, which were not previously there on the North, uh, the North American continent. Hmm. That's a whole other topic. (laughs) Okay. Long story short, the way the Spanish defeated the Aztecs was because the Aztecs were the power group and the, all the other smaller or, or less powerful Mesoamerican tribes in the area hated the Aztecs because of the way they treated them. Interesting. And so they, they, they knew that it was a risk siding with the Spanish, but they hated the Aztecs so much that they sided with the Spanish. And so it's then even then, even in like in Mexico a little bit, it would be like, well, who owned the land in Mexico? And that would quickly become a complicated complicated thing but you know it, it kind of reminds me and i i'd actually defer it makes me wish suddenly we had a, a peter nathan here or, or or some others who are far more historically astute but i know when assyria was finally taken down it was also a collection of oh, yeah. other peoples you right. know i mean babylon the scythians yep. there were a lot it was and, kind of a battle on, on who could get there first to start taking it down because <laughs> the assyrians had made they were it just goes to show you some people really think that if you could rule with enough strength and brutality. Nobody would rise up against you, but ultimately the opposite happens, which is eventually you have nothing to lose. Mm. And and the first time you can take down the bully, if the bully's a little weak one day, everybody will gain. Everybody. And and of course that's, that's what happened. Yeah. Uh, But again, uh, to to close this out, I, cause I don't feel like I made this point very well. The point was were the 
Mesoamerican tribes in Central and and uh, America and, and Mexico, modern the modern geographical terms, uh, living in peace and harmony together? No, they were raiding each other and stealing each other's people. The Aztecs, in particular, were raiding the other people and taking their people for the sacrifices. Because wow, ideally, really? you have to offer the sacrifices. That's that's a given. But ideally, you don't sacrifice your own people. You sacrifice, you sacrifice people the losers of your yeah, battles. Exactly. So. Exactly. Okay. Interesting. So then the other thing, and this will be our final point, segue into what you were going to talk about. Um, this was this is not a new thing because evangelical Christians, I would argue, have been aware of this for a long time, even all the way back to when Russia was still the Soviet Union. And so, um, you know, Mr. Armstrong, I think, I wonder if you could give him some credit for a greater interest in the American evangelical community over the decades in prophecy because he had such detailed prophecies. Mm. But the, uh, so, so how do you fit the Soviet union into prophecy and, and this whole thing, but a very common one. In fact, I'll even read you from, um, it's, it's an event evangelical Christian source that I picked that's, that would serve as a proxy for many of them. Cause many, many feel this way. Right, so a lot of them feel this way. You're just reading from one example. Exactly. And the question fun, fundamentally is, does Ezekiel 38 prophesy an end time attack on Israel by a coalition of nations before Christ returns? And so here's what the site says. Did the Bible prophesy Israel being attacked specifically by Iran, which is Persia, biblically, Ethiopia, Libya, and Turkey? And they think that Turkey is Gomer. I think we don't, we wouldn't agree with that, but it doesn't really matter. The point is they feel like this is Ezekiel 38 prophecy with, with these ancient biblical names or describe, we could figure out who they are um, in modern nations and it's this coalition. And so what I've seen is be, because of the way this war has erupted and how much Iran supports, um, ha- not just Hamas, but, uh, also, um, what's the one over in the West bank Hamas and, uh, Hezbollah, Hezbollah in, in Lebanon, in Lebanon. Lebanon. But I think they're also, in, okay. What, but anyway, they support all these groups and that this is going to grow into a wider regional war that's going to draw Iran in and maybe the U.S. in. And then Iran is supported by Russia. So you start having this whole Gog, Magog thing coalescing. And they think that that's going to happen before the return of Christ and that prophecy is about to be fulfilled. So then I don't know if any of you have heard this. I suspect some of our older listeners probably have. I don't know if our younger listeners have, but... Ezekiel 38 is a very detailed prophecy of Israel being attacked by a group of nations. Now, spoiler, it is not going to happen before the return of Christ. They're, they're incorrect. But I you thought that spoiled the story, yeah, Mr. Robinson. Oh, no. um, let me read uh, some of where they're getting this from, and then, and then maybe we can talk about why they're incorrect. Um, so Ezekiel 38 Verses 1 and 2 say, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog and the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Um, If you come down to verse 10 of Ezekiel 38, it says, Thus says the Lord God, On that day it shall come to pass that you will, the thoughts will arise in your mind, and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go up against an unwalled, uh, up against a land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither their bars nor their gates to plunder them and take their booty. And if you read the rest of it, it's clearly Israel that they've come down to plunder. So, Mr. Smith. Is Ezekiel 38, which I've already spoiled, (laughs) prophesying of an end time coalition of modern nations, Russia, Iran, who knows who who else will play into all of this um, because it's not my false prophecy doctrine. Um, Are they going to attack Israel the way they think before the return of Christ? Well, I hate to contradict what you said when you said you're going to spoil it. And so I won't. (laughs) Uh, No, you spoiled it correctly. No, that is not. That is not a prophecy before the millennium. And you read, you did read. Now I'm trying to remember. You did read the key. Well, I've already, I've already, I've already read the answer. Yeah. I I didn't want to, I didn't want to go into it before we had, because it was difficult to explain the setup without, without reading that part. Right. But the fact is it, it says, it talks about an unwalled city, essentially a city living in peace, right? With not without concern. Yeah, they dwell safely. They don't have walls. So they have neither bars nor gates. 
Now, I don't know if you've been keeping up with current events, <laughs> but for the insurgents to come in from Gaza and attack Israel, they literally had to bypass all those things. That's those exactly those right. kibbutzes that were close to the border had these bomb shelters, right. and they all went and hid in them. They had lots of walls, lots of guns. They did not dwell in It did. Safety. You had individuals, uh, that's some of the terrible stories. You had families who, one, the fact that they even had panic rooms is, is, is enough to tell you that it's a dangerous area. But how the panic rooms on October seventh it didn't do a lot of them any a lot of good because you had the uh, the terrorists coming in from Hamas and just breaking through doing whatever they had to you know trying to yell at them convince them to come out but no this is not a land right now that in any way fits the description put there in Ezekiel what Ezekiel is talking about is an attack that happens early in the millennium. When God has, we have the second exodus bringing uh, Israelites back into the promised land from all over the world where they have been captive and actually uh, the land is at peace. Yep. They're rebuilding yep. everything. And then you have others seeing an opportunity to take advantage. Yeah. Like Look how ah. prosperous they are. It's the oldest. It's one of the oldest economic policies in the world. <laughs> That's right. And not trade it. Go steal everybody else's stuff. So let's not go and humbly ask them, how do you do this? We would like mm -hmm. to do that as well. But no, let's go take it from them. Now, the Bible does say, of course, that a time is coming when it says uh, people from like 10 other nations or so will take a Jew by the sleeve and yep. say, Hey, we hear that God is with you. Please let us go to and learn. But that's not what's happening in Ezekiel. So no, I, the evidence is right there on the face. This is clearly not the current day. This is, this is a later time. Now we won't, we won't get into this, but there, there is, you might read Psalm 83 and uh, kind of picks it up in, in verse three, the most, but there is a, a prophesied confederacy against Israel. But but it's right. of, a, of a different nature. But either way, I thought it would be we would be doing our our duty if we try to explain to our younger audience. And if you hear or see anything where people are speculating that what prophecy is about to be fulfilled, and there's this Ezekiel prophecy, and it's going to happen. And especially if you read the whole thing and how God responds to it, um, no, that is that is not what lays ahead in the near future. That will not happen until after the return of Christ. So right, no, exactly. Exactly. Well, I don't know. I think I think hopefully we covered some key points. I'm sure there will, there are lots of things we could cover about that and other questions. We skip that, number that three. Is that have. is that cool? We we just we can skip it. Leave it. <laughs> you know what? Hey, well, 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 how, how long? I'll hit it real quick. I'll hit it real quick. You know, okay, so, do it. I'll hit it real you quick. Okay, because I I have seen this also. It's a good uh, distinction to me. It is a distinction. I think it ties in the, the the one we skipped ties into the second question, which was who has a claim to the land. Mm -hmm. Because the claim to the land, in one sense, definitely is uh, Israel, that is the people of Israel, that is Jacob. Um, but at the same time, God makes it kind of plain, if you want to stay in the land, you need to not sin, you know? I mean, he, I did promise it to you forever, but at the same time, you, you sin kind of thing. And and what we see right now in, in the nation is a, a secular nation, right? They're not necessarily... Uh, in fact, that's part of what was going on on, on October 7th was a bit of partying and stuff, even though it was the, the last great day. Uh, but that said, who was it that came in? Well, you see some of the individuals and, and you, again, you might have friends at school. You might have friends at college that are, they know you're a Bible person. It's like, oh man, I know, you know, what's going on. What we're seeing is like in the Bible, right? And they'll try to characterize it a certain way. And you might be tempted to go with one thing because it, it sounds like the kind of stuff we would say. And I, I've seen it uh, at least uh, one resource, but I, I, I feel I've seen it, heard it allude to in another. And that is that uh, what you're seeing play out in Israel today is a conf This is not true, but this is what you'll hear, is just the eternal conflict between uh, Israel, or sorry, uh, between uh, Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael yeah. The descendants of Isaac which would include Jacob, which would include Israel and the descendants of Ishmael, which are the Arabs. And it's easy to think that way because it, it's tempting because we definitely, there's conflict between Israel and Arab nations, et cetera. And you might be tempted and, and think your friends got a lot of insight there, right? Because that we tend to look at ancient peoples and, and the origins of those peoples and how that influences things today. But Mr. Hernandez has emphasized and will so in his and, article and rightly so and rightly so that don't be so quick to assume that's the case and be in a place to actually give your friends some additional insight 
that who knows, maybe he'll be interested in more of what we have to say. Uh, not all conflict between brothers is those two brothers. And as the, as the articles kind of point out that one thing about Ishmael and Isaac, you don't see that often resulting in Ishmael claiming the land for himself. That was actually very different. God gave Ishmael a variety of promises and you see those promises really kind of fulfilled in the Arab people and how they have a lot of lands. They've got the, the Arabian Peninsula, but there is a different set of brothers that you see involved. And that would be Jacob and Esau who were in conflict, even in the womb. And if you go back and read that in Genesis, how Rebecca says, man, if these kids are fussing like this, you know, and they're still inside my womb, what in the world are going to be like when they come out? Well, you know, what a great symbolism, by the way, is, the, isn't it amazing? The Bible's a brilliant document. It, it go figure. In fact, Mr. Mr. I can almost quote him, but Mr. Hernandez says, I think in the article that, uh, it's the greatest geopolitical manual, you know, whoever has existed, <laughs> something like that, because he, he, cause he uses the word geopolitical there, but it really is. And, and that's actually what you see going on here because, What's different about, uh, say, Jacob and uh, Esau compared to Ishmael and, and Isaac is Esau, there is some jealousy about the land because Esau sold the land. The birthright was Esau's, but he sold it for a bowl of lentils. And so he lost that birthright. But if you look, and I, I'm, gonna, I'm mainly using this as a promo for, for Mr. Hernandez's great insights. Um, there, if you look even biblically for centuries afterwards, in fact, there's at least like one prophecy. It's, it's almost 2000 years later, the, the Edomites who descended from Esau, they continue to yeah. want the land. Yeah. They yeah. want to claim the land for their own. And that's not the same as what you see with the Ishmaelites. There's definitely disagreement there, but not this focus on how the land is really ours. So, so no, don't, don't, don't just kind of fall for biblical talk that some of your, you know, say more insightful, I give them credit for trying to look at the Bible to understand things. But ultimately part of the lesson we want you to do is to avoid two other tempting sources. That's worldly sources that want to make you think in a worldly way about worldly affairs and to pick a worldly side. But on the other side, those people that sound more attractive because they talk biblically uh, whether they're evangelical Christians and others and be careful about all of that, you mm -hmm. know, g give, talk to your pastor about that. Look into church materials about that. We have a whole booklet called the Middle East in Prophecy uh, by Mr. Richard Ames, you know, go to our materials and take a look at that and look at them with your Bible. And, and while you're doing all of this, I hope you'll pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We are encouraged in the Bible and the Psalms to do that because on both sides over there right now, there's a lot of suffering going on. And one thing all of us should be, regardless of who is involved, is we should be a people of compassion. And the fact is, and Mr. Hernandez brings this out, he brings it out in person, he bring, brought it out in a Facebook video he did for Spanish-speaking uh, followers is that in all these people, there's so little hope because there just is no human solution to what's going on. And if you want to say, Oh, I'm rooting for Israel or I'm rooting for this. Well, if they win, do you think that's going to solve everything? It's just not, there is no human solution. That area is going to be in turmoil until Jesus Christ returns. It's either in a state of open turmoil or it's a state where the turmoil is under the surface. It is going to know no actual, real, fundamental peace until Jesus Christ comes to give it that peace. And so in a sense, really praying for the peace of Jerusalem is essentially praying for the return of Christ because that's really the only source of peace it's ever going to have. Smith and Robinson.